That was beautiful. Doesn't he have a beautiful voice, everybody? Look at that. Thank you, Jesus. That speaks to us. Amen? Beautiful. Beautiful. Today we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Please ask you to prepare your hearts for that. I want us to start in Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Before we get into our message. How's everybody doing this morning, okay? It's great to see everybody. Beautiful day, beautiful people, beautiful church. Amen? Beautiful Lord and Savior. Okay, this is a great message, this is a great scripture to start us off this morning. Philippians chapter 4. She got us in verse 6, but I'm going to back us up a little bit as always to verse 4. Go to verse 4. Verse 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon, or the Lord is near. Verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Big amen. amen. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank him for all that he has done. And he's done so much for us. Thank you, Jesus. Then you will experience God's peace. Here's a formula there. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he's done. And then you will experience God's peace. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind. As you live in Christ Jesus. In other words, as you live by the word of God. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts or your mind on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. <clears throat> Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. In verse 9, the most important part of this at all, of all. Keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. How about a big amen to amen. Amen. So what is he saying? As we learn the word of God and study the word of God, they tell us, he tells Paul tells us to put it into practice everything that we're learning. So obviously, we've got to keep practicing this. And practice in this, and practice this, so we can experience God's peace. Other than that, when we go out into this world, we're not going to experience that peace if we don't put into practice everything that we're learning when we come to church. Did amen? Amen. No. All right, that was a great scripture. All right, we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, and it's going to be a very important message on that. It's going to be short and sweet, but to the point, as always, I just want to give a little testimony before. We used to celebrate the Lord's Supper when we were a smaller congregation. We used to all go out to dinner after we celebrate the Lord's Supper and have a fellowship meal. Now, since we're a little bit big, we're going to have to buy a restaurant. <laughs> so obviously we can't do it that way, so we're going to pass on the elements anyway. But it's a beautiful thing either way, amen? amen. Okay. <clears throat> it's a natural human tendency to forget. Events fade into the past. Life moves forward with new experiences, and we can lose sight of that which brought us to where we are. God understands us and knows our tendencies. When the Israelites were on the verge of entering the promised land, which the Lord would give them, he warned, beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Amen. from the house of bondage, Deuteronomy 6, 12. Knowing our tendency to forget, God throughout history has provided memorials of observances 
for his people. The Passover was the annual memorial given for the Israelites to remember what God had done for them in releasing them from bondage to the Egyptians in Exodus 12, verses 11 to 14. The event remembered in the Passover was the salvation event for the Israelites. It released them from the physical bondage of slavery to the Egyptians. It led to the establishment of the covenant at Sinai and the Israelites as God's covenant people. Thus, the Passover was observed every year as a reminder of God's salvation. On the night he would be betrayed, the day before he would be crucified, Jesus gathered his disciples for the observance of the Passover. In the midst of the observance, Jesus veered from the script and took the bread blessed it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, Mark 14, 22. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, Mark 14, 24. With these two common elements, the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, Jesus established a memorial by which we remember our salvation through his death as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 26. It is that burial in resurrection that we have our salvation. In this event, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has fulfilled the ultimate purposes of God and has rendered the Passover observance obsolete. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. What is striking about the Lord's Supper is the simplicity of the memorial in comparison to its significance. Okay? Every first week of the month, Christians gather to remember his sacrifice, a sacrifice which our salvation, which established a new covenant in his blood and establishes Christians as his covenant people. The Lord's Supper is observed in memory of an event that reconciles us to our Father and gives us hope for eternity. Thanks be to God for his great love and for the memorial he left for us by which we remember his great sacrifice. How about an amen for that? <laughs> Communion is a sacred time for us as followers of Jesus. But before we participate in this memorial occasion, let us take a moment of silence to spend some reflective moments in self-examination and prepare our hearts to receive the elements and really take in and internalize what Jesus died to give us. Let's have a moment of silence. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we bow before you in humility and ask you to examine our hearts today, show us anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering our relationship with you. We know that we are your beloved children, having received you into our hearts and lives, and having accepted your death as a penalty for our sinfulness. The price you paid covered us for all time, and our desire is to live for you. As we take the bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who receive you. We can't begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, yet you took that pain for us. You died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, we too receive this bread in remembrance of you. And in the same way as we take this cup representing your blood poured out from the splinted cross, we realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all of our sin, past, present, and future. Because of your blood shed for us and your body broken for us, we can be free from the power and penalty of sin. Thank you for your victory over death. You took the death that we deserved. You took our punishment. Your pain was indeed our gain. 
And today we remember and celebrate the precious gift of life you gave us through the blood that you spilled. But while our relationship is secure with you, we know sin can break our fellowship at times. We are still human and we often forget who we are and who we belong to. You want to convict and correct us, not shame us. You love us like a perfect parent. You never disown us or leave us. Your love, you love us no matter what. Your sin hurts both our hearts and yours. So before we take communion today, I'm asking you to truly search our hearts and reveal hidden things for which to ask for your forgiveness. Each time we take communion, Lord, we want to recommit our life, our heart, our thoughts, our everything to you. Fill us today with your powerful spirit. As we leave this place, help us to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our hearts. Help us to share its message faithfully as you give us opportunity in your precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We take communion to remember the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He broke the bread and gave thanks. We remember communion and the events that led to Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. At this time, I'm going to call the ushers to come forward and pass out the elements. If you want to follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you or which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the Lord's broken body, let us take the bread. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, 
This cup is a new covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are renouncing the Lord's death until He comes again. In remembrance of the Lord's death and shed blood, let us drink the cup. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us so much that you would spare nothing, not even your Son, to save us from our sins. Help us always remember that love and reflect on his sacrifice on our behalf. Give us the strength to live our lives by faith in him this week, O oh Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 How about a hand clap for your word? <laughs> that went well. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we are going to continue our message on the power of the Word of God in the Bible. We were in it last week. We're going to continue in it this morning. The power of the Word of God, which is God's instruction manual for us. But before we go there, I'm going to ask you a question. You remember what I asked you last week for homework? Did you read it? Yes. All right, let's go. Let's go there. Come on, let's read it together now. <laughs> what a great family we have there. <laughs> The beautiful song of David that brings joy to my heart every time I read it. And now as we read it as a family, it will be joy to all of our hearts. I was going to text everybody all week long. Don't forget to do your homework. <laughs> I said, no, nah, I'll let it give you a pass this time. I think they got it. <laughs> All right, verse one. Oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. One thing we know, God always knows our thoughts and what we're thinking. We may be able to fool a lot of people, but we can't fool God. Amen? Mm -hmm. This will give us a healthy fear of God. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say even before I say it. Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. That's a big amen there. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, or Sheol, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. Thank you, Jesus. I could ask the darkness to hide me, and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. You know it as well as I do. People wait for my time to do whatever they want to do. It's not good. Like they say, nothing's good. Nothing happens after midnight that's good. Can I get any amen for this? But guess what? You can't hide from God. He still sees you in the night. 
I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to come night, but even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. What a beauty of creation there. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship, <laughs> your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me? Or how precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Oh, thank you, Lord. The devil always tries to make us feel like he's not with us. But he's always with us. He promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. How about a big amen for that? Now look what it says here. Oh, God, if you would only destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. Here it is in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. How about a big amen? Do you see what he says here in verse 24? Point out anything in me that offends you, not in somebody else that offends you. Can I get a big amen for this? A lot of times Christians like to point out other people's faults, but God says, point out anything in me that offends you. Keep it on yourself. That's a 24-7 job. Amen? That was a great scripture. So, did everybody like that scripture when they yeah. read it? It's yeah. even better when we read it as a family. Amen? Amen. Don't worry. I'm going to give you plenty of homework. Hey, look. If God wants me to study it, I'm going to make you study it, too. <laughs> You're not getting off the hook. <laughs> Right. The power of the Word of God. We face many challenges. Can I get any amount for this? Many, many. But God has given us a book, the Holy Bible, to help us. Here's how the power of the Word of God can serve as an instruction manual for life. And we talked about this last week. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt nothing seemed to be going right? When it seemed like no matter what you did, things went from bad to worse. Is that just the way his life is supposed to be? Or is it possible that many or even most of these things can be fixed? Someone may say, I wish we had a manual of instruction for life. And we do. It's called the Bible. The living Word of God. Can I get an amen for this? Listen, we don't just come to church and read the Bible. We read the Bible as the owner's man to our life when we're not in church. We need to understand that we need to live by what we believe in. And the only way we're going to live to live by what we believe in is if we read it and put it into practice and apply it to our lives. Can I get a big amen for this? We need an instruction manual. The most important product that are brought into existence is human life. There was a time when God took some clay and some wet dust and made the first man. Then from his body, God made a companion, the first woman. Thank God we have women. Amen. Well, thank God we have women. Amen. Because they really, really do help us as much as we don't like to say it. 
they always show us love unconditionally. They have the heart of God. They really do. And I love all the women. They really do. As much as some of them rub me the wrong way. <laughs> God tells me to love everybody like he loves me. And he tells us as husbands to never treat your wife harshly. And I say, okay, ouch, Lord, I need a lot of help in that area. And it always says the Bible for the wife to always submit to their husbands. And we all need practice in this area too. But there's a time and a place to talk about relationships, and we will get to that eventually. So what is the Word of God? Ultimately, God's teaching were recorded by faithful men he used to put together an instruction book, a how-to live book that we know as the Bible and the Holy Scriptures. Let us begin in 2 Timothy chapter 3, please, this morning. Chapter 3, verse 16. Like I said before, the owner's manual in your glove compartment still probably has plastic over it. <laughs> Everybody buys a new car, but that opens the owner's manual to read what, what, what entails and how to take care of it until the check engine light comes on. Mm. <laughs> Same thing with our lives, right? We wait till our lives will start falling apart and making a mess, then we decide to go to God. Say, God, can you fix me? Yeah. And thank God that he can. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's never too late. Every day he begins afresh. Amen. Don't ever think that you've gone too far where you can't come back to him. Always go back to Jesus. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake him. He will, you will leave him, but he will never, ever leave you. Amen. Amen. The Bible promises that. And all the Bible is promises are yea and amen, which are true. Amen. It's true. Now, look what it says in verse 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, all Scripture, all Scripture means the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and what else does it do? Make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. You know what as well as I do, we have to be taught how to do the right thing. We don't have to be taught how to do the wrong thing, it's already in us. But as we become believers in Jesus Christ, we have to learn how to do things God's way and not our way. Now look what it says in verse 17. God uses the Bible uses it to prepare and equip his people to ever do, to do every good work. So if anybody wants to be a servant of the Lord, God uses the Bible to prepare and equip his people to do the task. If I didn't read and study the Bible, I wouldn't be able to do the task I'm doing this morning with you. Can I get an amen for this? So you need to read the Bible so you can find out what God needs you to do. Go with me now to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going as long as I can, but I have to for the sake of time keep moving us along. Don't worry, keep coming here for a while. You're going to know the Bible later on. That's right. Because that's the only thing that's going to save you. I can't save you. People can't save you. Nobody can save you. 
Only Jesus can save you. Amen? Amen. And Jesus is the Word of God, by the way. And as long as I'm up here, I'm going to teach you the Word of God. Amen. When we become believers in Jesus Christ, the Word of God becomes alive. The Holy Spirit enters into the believer, which gives us the light of God's truth, and he gives us the word of God which becomes part of our lives and is alive now. The written word becomes the living word. Amen. As it says in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So now, when we read the word of God, the word of God becomes our owner's manual and becomes our ultimate convictor. When we decide that we want to live a certain way, then we start reading the Bible, and it contradicts the way we're living, we start to get convicted. That's what it does. What it does, it speaks to our heart which is our conscience. You see, when you start reading the Word of God, your conscience is now alive. God speaks to our hearts. Like, That's not the way to go. Amen. This is the way to go. Don't do that. I love you, my child. You do not understand what it's going to do to you in the long run. I know from the beginning to the end that every sin you commit will eventually kill you. Mm -hmm. So he says, I'm going to give you a book to help you stop doing that. Amen. But if you do not read it, you will not be able to stop sinning. You will not be able to get new desires and your heart will not change if you do not read the Word of God, study the Word of God, and apply the Word of God to your life. The written Word will always be the written Word. You'll leave the church and be the same way you were when you walked in. And that is not why God saved you. God saved you for a purpose. So you can become like His Son, the Lord Jesus. Something that you could never do apart from His Holy Spirit entering into you. Can I get any amen for that? Amen. That is why Jesus came, to save you from yourself so you can become like his son and be a living example of Jesus Christ living his life through you when you go out into the lost and dying world. Amen. That is why you got saved. You didn't get saved so you could have a better life because your life is not going to get better down here as a Christian. As a matter of fact, when you start living God's way, it's going to get worse. Your life is going to get better when it goes home to be with him. Amen. Down here, we're living in a temporary residence. We are just passing through. Amen. So if you're expecting your best life now, then you won't read your Bible because it won't help you. But if you really want to understand why God saved you and created you, you'll stop reading His Word and you'll stop living for Him and understanding that joy comes in giving and not receiving. Amen. So I'm going to say the benefits of studying the Word of God. How about a big amen for that? Amen. Amen. We offer many opportunities in this ministry to study the Word of God. Amen. The doors are open on Wednesday, Monday, to learn God's Word as a supplement so you can get a better understanding of it, so you can grow into the image of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The Word of God is an incredible how-to book inspired by God, our Creator. He designed it to teach us how to make life work. It is larger than any other instruction manual, and its size can be daunting. But don't let that stop you. Even just a little reading to get you started down a path that will change the way you think, and in time, change the way you live, making your life more fulfilling and meaningful. Amen. From the very first chapters of the first book, Genesis, you'll learn where you came from, why you are here, and where your journey can lead you. You'll also learn how to make that journey safer and more rewarding, and how to avoid painful hazards along the way. Man is no evolutionary accident. He is the highest handiwork of the created God in the physical realm. Can I get any amen for this? This masterpiece was just the beginning of what he had in mind. And within this awesome book, the Word of God, are the instructions to help us make this limited life work and take us to even 
better, a better limitless life. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Everybody with me so far here? Yeah? Well, oh, you're going to know this by running out when you're done here. Yeah? Lock the doors. Nobody's leaving until we leave the whole book. Get the chain. chapter 2 verse 10. And you know, if you can't get there fast enough, don't worry about it, okay? Go slow, go easy. If somebody on the side can get you there, but help somebody. Help somebody get there if they know the Bible. Everybody's in a different place. It's okay. It's okay not to know it all the way. Amen. Help each other. Help each other. This is what we're supposed to do when we're here. Guide and help each other. Not tear each other up, but build each other up in love. And they meant for this. We're to practice Amen. love in this church so we can show love out when we're not in church. Amen. So if somebody's having a hard time finding the scriptures and you're not, help them find them. Amen. How about a big amen for that? Amen. Let's show some love in our home. Because God calls us His masterpiece. Look at verse 10. We're God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. He created us new by the Word of God. See, it's the Word of God that creates us anew. Why? Why did He create us and why did He save us? So we can do the thing, good things He planned for us long ago, something that our sin nature would never let us do. You see, He created us anew. He gave us His Holy Spirit. He put His Holy Spirit in us. He gave us His Word to change us so we can do the good things that He planned for us long ago. Can I get an amen to this? That's why He saved us. So we can do things for Him rather than ourselves, which is the problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. Serving ourselves was the problem. No other book ever printed has sold more copies than the Word of God. No other book. Yet its wealth of information remains untouched and unused by most who own a copy. Like I said before, the book of Proverbs is a storehouse of guidelines and helpful instructions for avoiding painful problems we humans can so easily stumble into. It is much better to avoid them than to struggle to extricate ourselves after falling into them. Amen? Amen. Wisdom is knowledge applied. You get the knowledge it will. The Bible tells me, if I do this, this is going to be the result of it. We're all made up of the same stuff. So if we do what the, if we do what the Bible says not to do, the result we're going to get is guaranteed. Because we're all made of the same stuff. That's why the Bible says, don't do it. We're very finite. We only see the moment. God knows if you continue in that behavior or that sinful behavior, the result is going to be death. Something is going to happen that's going to destroy you. So the only reason why, see your sin does not hurt God anymore. Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. You are perfect. See, God sees you as he sees his son. Your sins hurt you and they hurt other people. They do not hurt God anymore. Your sins have been all forgiven. You are washed in the blood of Christ. You are brand new in Jesus Christ in his eyes and you can't do no wrong in his eyes. He says, but while you're down here, your sins are going to hurt you and eventually destroy you till you come home to be with me. He wants to keep you safe. And the Word of God is our book of safety to stop, help us from falling into many problems that we can't see down the road. Because the devil is very crafty. He will make you get pleasure out of something for a season. You get some pleasure out of it. Your flesh will get gratified for a season. But in the end, it's going to lead to death. You can't see it coming. But God already knows the beginning to the end. We can't see it coming. And sin is very subtle. If sin, was very, if sin wasn't subtle, we wouldn't commit it. No one is going to destroy us. Mm. So we get comfort out of it for a season. But in the end, it kills you. You end up becoming miserable, far away from God. And you end up worshiping the devil and you don't even know you were doing it. Mm. He's very sneaky, the devil. He wants to take Christians right out of the box. 
He wants to make us live for him instead of Jesus. And he does it very suddenly because you get away with it for a while. You get away with doing it. You get away with not reading your Bible. You get away with not going to church. You get away with not studying the Word. You get away with it for a while. Then the devil gets you way back into your flesh. And then he hits you with a temptation you get no power to overcome. And then you fall head first into it again. But when you have the instruction manual with you and the temptation comes, we can say, no, submit to God, resist the devil, and he's got to go. Amen. But if we don't have that, those tools in our heart, we can't resist it. We cannot be strong. We're not stronger than the devil. He's stronger than we are by far. We all know the tempter comes and tempts us, especially Christians that are trying to walk a righteous path. He tries to take us off the path. That's why it's so important to stay gathered. If we don't think, you know, if you look at the, if you go out in the wild, you see a lion hunting for a wildebeest. He's not going in the middle of the pack to get it. He's, he's looking after the one that's in the back. The one that's lagging behind, then the lion comes and pounces on him. That's what he does with Christians. Christians that are slacking and not reading the Bible, living for the world and living worldly things. He comes and snatches them, ruins them, and destroys their testimony in their life. Because why? They're not in the pack, in the house of God where they belong to get strength. Amen. This is where we get strength as numbers. Amen. We get picked off on the outside. We need to stay together. Even when we're not here, we need to fellowship with each other. Give somebody a call. Talk to somebody that's going on the same path. We have to stay connected to other believers. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to stay connected. He's the head of the church. If you're not connected to a church, you're disconnected from the vine. And he can always get at you. Can't get me none for this. Why do I say these things? Because I know. I know the pitfalls. Why? Because I get tempted more than all of these do. As the leader, the devil tries to pick me off in every which way. So because once the leader falls, so does the, so does the flock. So I have to stay strong in the Lord. I get that Bible book. I got it in my hand, I got it, I got it on, in the, on my Bluetooth at work when I'm painting cars. I got it in my ear, I got it playing all the time. The devil's always after me, especially when I'm out there in traffic. Oh my goodness. I'm saying, you know, they got nice Christian fish you put on the bumper. I can't put it on there yet. I, can't, I cannot be godly enough in traffic yet. I got a long way to go. And this, this is the way it is. That's one of my weaknesses. Everybody has a weakness. I'm not going to represent the Lord on the back of my bumper if I'm driving like a maniac right now on something from the moon. You know what's happening? God's saying, John, you need to slow down. Slow down, John. I'm trying to protect you. You're trying to get around me, right? I can't wait for the guy going slow to turn. He turns, and then I'm stuck behind the school bus. I just can't get away. <laughs> this is what happens, right? And then I keep going, and there's a guy on the side of the road with the radar gun. Yeah, right. Just dying to pick me off. And the guy says, see, I'm trying to save you from that guy. He yeah, was. I'm not going to to get me. But I couldn't go any faster because the bus was in front of me. <laughs> That's what's God protecting me. But I'm always, uh, is anybody relate to me with this? Go, 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 go. <laughs> always got to be there. Go, 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 go. I'm saying, chill out, John. I go ahead of you. Yeah. And I, I try to remember that every day. <laughs> Why God gives us do's and don'ts? Let me explain this to you. Most instructions that come with the product we purchase include a number of do's and don'ts. Don't overinflate the tires, right? Because they'll wear out too fast. Change your oil every 5,000 miles. If you don't, what happens to it? It gets all thick and gummy and you end up needing a new motor. It tells us to do that, right? Do replace the filters regularly so the air can flow properly and you get better mileage. Follow the manual's recommendations and the result will be fewer problems for the owner plus additional years of service. It's the same thing with the Bible, okay? Not following them will result in a shorter product life, more expensive repairs in the long run, and failure to achieve the desired results. You know it as well as I do. You go to get your oil change, they open up the thing and say, 
There's no oil in here. I wonder why your car was tripping. You waited until it started making too much noise before you bought it to Jiffy Boo. Instead of saying, oh, most cars tell you now when it's time to change your oil. It comes up on the bag. Service ends in Zoom. They will say, ah, ah, ah. just wait and wait and wait till you get tick, 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 tick. <laughs> oh, you go to turn the car. <laughs> oh. I get any math for this? Yeah. Same thing with the Bible. We don't open it until we get into problems again. Instead of avoiding them, we get into them, then we go back to it. Okay? God's instruction for us with a number of do's and don'ts. While many do those do's and don'ts as things that might make life more enjoy less enjoyable, really they're just the opposite is true. <coughs> there are many helpful guidelines in the Bible. Within its pages are an abundance of diverse topics, such as finances, choosing our friends wisely. The Bible tells us bad company corrupts good character. Don't think you can go around, around ungodly people and make them bring them godly. What they'll do is make you ungodly. You get a good piece of fruit, right? And you put, you get a, a nice bowl of fruit, right? I'll make an example. And you put a rotten peach in the middle of it. Do you think that good bowl of fruit makes that peach good again? Or does the rotten peach make the rest of the fruit rotten? Get my point? Exactly. If you go around people that are corrupt, your life will get corrupted too. That's why it's important to hang around people that are on the same path as you are. Believe me, you can't bring them on, you can't bring them to God, only the Holy Spirit can. You can tell them about Jesus, but it says beware, lest you fall into the same problems they do. That's why it tells us. While achieving and maintaining a healthy relationship, what to eat and not to eat, the importance of balance and moderation in life. The Bible is filled with practical advice that can help us in every aspect of life. Can I get amen for this? Through the primary message of the Bible is to lead us to understand the purpose of life and how to grow with godly character and receive the gift of eternal life. God wants us to learn to avoid a lot of mistakes that would cause us to suffer in this life. All right, let's go to a closing scripture. Let's go to John 10. Two scriptures, man. And remember, we are going to have coffee in after service. We want to fellowship with each other in there. Get to know each other a little better. So don't run away. Lock the door. Go this way. I want to get to know all of Okay. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 9, okay? Jesus talking here, verse 9. I am the gate. Those who come in through me, through Jesus, will be saved. All will find safety. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. There it is in verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus' purpose, my purpose, is to give them a rich, and satisfying life. When you come to the Lord, and you come to Him in the Spirit, you will have a rich and satisfying life. But if you try to come to the Lord in the flesh, you will have a miserable Christian life. Because your flesh is supposed to get crucified. That's why. You can't have a good Christian life in the flesh. Your Christian life, you'll always want, want, want in the flesh. When the Bible crucifies your flesh. In the Spirit, you will have a rich and satisfying life. Can I get an amen to that? Coming in the flesh, it'll... It'll make you miserable. <clears throat> Last one, Matthew 7, 12. The golden rule. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. And in verse 13, it goes on to tell us it's a narrow gate. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. 
The highway to hell, the road that leads to destruction is broad, and his gate is wide for many who choose that way. Here's one thing I want you all to remember. You have to make a choice. God does not take away your free will choices. You can choose to do what you want to do, or you can choose to do what God wants you to do, and he will give you the power to do it. So don't think you're a way to your choice. The only reason why Jesus saves you is so you can make the right choice yeah. instead of the wrong one. He doesn't take away your choices, or sometimes we wish he would, so we can make all good ones. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't. But we have to make the choice. And it says, the gateway to destruction is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life, this is the one that's important, is very narrow. Why is it narrow? Because the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. See, the road is narrow because our flesh does not want to die. Mm -hmm. It wants to live the Christian life in the flesh. It doesn't want to die. But the road that leads to life requires us to die to ourselves. You see, that's why the road is narrow. But when you die to yourself and you live for the Lord, is when you truly find why you were created. But you can never find it in the flesh. That's why you're always looking to buy something or do something more, or to make more money, or do better things, or get better stuff. Because you can't get satisfied. That hole in your heart, God put there. And He's the only one that can fill it. And until you realize that, He'll let you go and do whatever you want to do. You want to go make more money, you want to get a bigger home, you want to get better this and a better that. And then at the end of the day, you'll sit there and you'll say, now what? Mm. Once you get there, mm. you're never satisfied. Mm. So you can go for the rest of your life seeking after the things of the world, or you can say, you know what? I've had enough of that stuff. I'm going to start seeking after the things of God. And once you get there, the road gets a lot brighter for you. Because then you can say, now you're, on, you're, now you're in my road. Yeah. Once you get on my road, it's more satisfying. Once you stay on yours, you're never satisfied. And God will not put a satisfying spirit in you if you're living for yourself. That's just the way it is. So just remember, read your Bible. <laughs> From Genesis to Revelation, if you don't want to read it, I will read it for you. Go on www.thewayministries.org and I have it and I read the whole thing for you. So go on the podcast and read it and learn it and study it so you can become like Jesus, the very reason why he saved you. Amen. I get a big amen for that. Amen. All right, we're going to close there. Thank you for letting me share that message. The ushers are going to come forward to take the collection. We are going to stand and worship the Lord and close.